It's the Second World War, and Britain is under siege. Continental Europe is quickly giving way before the onslaught of Adolf Hitler's Third Reich, and it seems undeniable that before long the entire continent will come under Hitler's thrall. Mercifully insulated from the land invasion by the English Channel in the North Sea and able to withstand aerial bombardment from the Luftwaffe, Britain is unlikely to be quickly or authoritatively steamrolled on the battlefield, and though neither side is sure that the UK can win a war of attrition, the British Home Islands are at least equipped to hold out. But if His Majesty's Kingdom cannot dominate outright, then it can be starved. And starvation is precisely Adolf Hitler's weapon of choice. By waging war on the high seas, fought by an undersea fleet of submarines that the Third Reich had spent years preparing, Nazi Eye Command will attempt to cut off the British. If they succeed, they will force the UK into a peace treaty negotiated at gunpoint. If the Allies hope to survive, then every man at sea will be forced to fight this battle as if it would be his last. This is the story of the Battle of the Atlantic, Hitler's devastating campaign against the Allies at sea, and the desperate Allied effort to find a way to survive. Even before Germany began its campaign of expansion within Europe in 1939, Adolf Hitler and his top military planners understood that an invasion of the British home islands would be a protracted and potentially ruinous affair. Separated from continental Europe by easily defensible seas, which themselves were protected by a very powerful and modern navy, Britain was not likely to be occupied by Germany in the same way that France or Poland had been. Beyond the simple fact that an invasion was militarily unfeasible, Hitler was known to harbour far more cordial feelings towards Great Britain than any of his adversary nations on the European continent, and he believed that the British were natural allies to his fascist cause, despite the hostility that Brits at the time very clearly felt towards Nazi Germany. As many Nazi leaders saw it, Britain had only entered the war and fought against them because of its guarantees to support allies like Poland in Europe. With this in mind, the Third Reich's goal in 1940 had far less to do with the conquest of Britain than the negotiation of a favourable peace. With few, if any, real ambitions to take Great Britain anytime soon, German military planners turned instead to the question of how they could usher Britain along to the idea of a truce. For Germany in particular, the answer was simple, and it was the solution the country had already relied upon during the last World War the U boat, or submarine. U-boats had proven to be a massive thorn in the Allied power side during World War I, so much so that after the war, most of the world tried to abolish their use. But this effort had ultimately been unsuccessful, and even though the post-war conditions of the Treaty of Versailles severely limited the number of surface ships that Germany could produce, the treaty didn't say anything about submarines. Hitler himself had called for the German U-boat fleet to be rebuilt prior to World War II as a critical part of his military strategy to take the Atlantic. In a theoretical sense, these U-boats had the potential to be the linchpin of German efforts to force a treaty with Britain. The country's heavy reliance on foreign imports and its voracious appetite, not just for essential but luxury goods from its colonies abroad, was an obvious pressure point for the Germans. If the British controlled their own home islands, but the Germans controlled all maritime access to those islands, then Germany could impose massive costs to the British people as a sort of punishment for staying at war. A punishment that would, of course, disappear if the British government saw the light of day as Hitler wanted them to. Between economic pressure, resource starvation, and staggering losses of both military and merchant sailors, Britain could be pressured and pressured until it gave in. When war broke out, the Kriegsmarine fielded an underwater fleet made up of 65 commissioned submarines, a handful of which were Type 7 U-boats. These submarines, of which over 700 would be built by the war's end, were very advanced for their time. The most common variant, the Type 7C, had a range of 15,700 kilometers with the ability to operate up to 750 feet below the water's surface, a submerged speed of 14 kilometers per hour, and an overall size of over 50 meters. The ships were survivable, they were dangerous in combat, and they carried lethal torpedoes. Initially called straight runners, these torpedoes simply went where the U-boat was pointed at, like a bullet from a gun, but later in the war, homing torpedoes also became available. The British and the other Allied navies were prepared to fight surface battles against the Nazis, but they were not equipped to deal with U-boats en masse. After an initial wave of surprise attacks and ambushes when the war first began, the Germans very quickly turned every Allied surface vessel into a sitting duck, and the British, functionally stuck on their islands, 
had very little means of fighting back. The early years of World War II were referred to by German submariners as the Happy Time, and from their perspective, the name was a bit of a natural fit. For the first months of the war, German submarines had to assume substantial risks while attempting dangerous crossings through the North Sea because of the ability of British and French ships to contest the area. But when France was decisively defeated at the end of June 1940, U-boats could run basically unchecked along the entire European coastline, and since the United States hadn't yet ended the war, those same U-boats had almost nothing else to fear in the wider Atlantic. Germany quickly set to work, making themselves comfortable in French port cities, which had all the facilities necessary necessary to give submarine fleets a forward operating base. Their targets were an unending series of regular supply and merchant convoys traveling across the ocean from Canada, the United States, and South America, all trying to reach the British Isles. During these early years, convoys would travel together in the dozens, sometimes more than 50 merchant ships all gathered together. The reason for this was simple. If the ships sailed together, they could be shepherded through the Atlantic by a smaller number of warships, and if one of them were attacked, survivors could be loaded onto the surrounding ships. It was a much better approach than just allowing single ships to travel scattershot through the Atlantic, holding their breath the entire way. But the convoy method also had an unavoidable and fatal flaw. If the Germans did find one ship, they would find dozens, all ripe for the taking. See, the Royal Navy during this period didn't have access to the kind of onboard radar systems that they'd get later on in the war. They also lacked high frequency radio direction finders, which were later used to find enemy radio transmissions. With no radar and no direction finders, British surface warships had very little means to detect German submarines before they struck. So called hunting groups, a squad of surface warships centered around an aircraft carrier, did their best to patrol shipping lanes. But even with air reconnaissance, these hunting groups were ineffective in spotting submarines most of the time. U-boats were consistently better at spotting these groups than the groups were at spotting them. And even when a plane did see a U-boat, they lacked any appropriate weaponry to attack them directly. By the time surface warships arrived on the scene, U-boats were already gone. By the time France was taken, these hunting groups were already known to be ineffective, and the loss of a continental ally meant that Britain was now putting its own warships at far greater risk. But as far as the convoys were concerned, the loss of the hunting groups didn't matter anyhow. And as the Royal Navy began to realize just how vulnerable their convoys were, the Germans got better and better at hunting them down. Individual U-boats faced the same quandary as a lone lion stalking a herd of wildebeest. While getting the kill was easy enough, it was a shame to see so many other potential feasts be allowed to escape. Under Admiral Carl Donitz, the U-boat fleet was able to find the same solution as any other hunting animal. They formed packs and hunting tactics that they'd already refined by the time the first happy time began. Coordinated by Donitz personally, U-boats would patrol in long lines, searching for convoys, and then congregate once a convoy had been sighted. As many U-boats as could get there in time would mass together close to the convoy, and if the so-called wolf pack assessed that their strength could overcome the strength of the convoy escorts, then they would attack in force. Their most fruitful window for attack was during the night, when the submarines could surface and avoid the sonar of Allied ships. They were also functionally impossible to see, sitting so low in the water. Even during the day, though, they were exceptionally hard to deal with, especially with the help of spotter planes, Fokker Wolf Condor bombers who could identify convoys from the air and sink a few ships on their own. Their attacks were devastating, and during the first happy time, the British could do very little to stop them. Convoy SC-7, which sailed from Nova Scotia to Liverpool, was intercepted by a pack of eight U-boats in October 1940 in a devastating attack that saw 20 merchant ships sunk out of a total of 35. Although the five escort ships remained mostly unscathed during the attack, they were unable to inflict even a single casualty on the German side, and the entire affair proved just how disorganized Allied escort vessels really were. 141 British sailors died in the attack, which would be remembered as the most devastating of the entire war in the Atlantic. Around the same time, just five U-boats were able to sink 12 ships out of 60 in convoy HX-79, even despite those five U-boats being outnumbered more than two to one by Allied escort ships by the time the battle ended. All in all, U-boats were able to claim two and a half million tons of Allied goods during 1940 alone, with well over half of that lost during the first happy time. None of the attacks were as completely devastating as the attack on convoy SC-7, but the vast majority were entirely successful, with only minimal losses on the German side, but a stark loss of life for the Allies. 
Hundreds of Allied ships went down during these few months, and individual German U-boat commanders rose to prominence as naval aces. Had the U-boat fleet kept up this kill rate uninterrupted, they may well have crippled the British overnight and brought His Majesty to his knees before peace negotiations even began. But the United Kingdom got a reprieve in late 1940. Not only did a difficult winter make it more challenging for U-boats to find and engage their targets, but the United States was beginning to send more active support to the UK as well, including dozens of aging destroyers supplied courtesy of Uncle Sam. British wartime industry was starting to kick into full swing around this time as well, and the Royal Navy finally got around to accepting that they would need to maintain escort groups and develop defensive strategies in order to win the war. Finally, more and more of the German U-boats were starting to require routine port maintenance taking many out of the fight for weeks or months at a time. But perhaps more important than any of that was the Royal Navy finally coming to understand that these packs of submarines were even more devastating than German surface vessels and that the only way to deal with the submarine problem was to address it directly. Britain developed new tactics to deal with the U-boat onslaught and standardized their escort group somewhat. Moving into 1941, escort ships would typically consist of some five or six corvettes backing up two or three destroyers, and their crews began to receive specific training to deal with the U-boat threat, particularly under Vice Admiral Gilbert O. Stevenson, who oversaw a training program in the Northwest Scottish Isles. A few months later, shortwave radar started to make its way into the British fleet, giving warships and airplanes alike the ability to discover U-boats that had come up to surface or were sneaking around. At night. The tide began to turn in Britain's favor during early 1941. In March of that year, convoy HX112 and its escort fleet, four destroyers and two corvettes, were able to deal with a pack of five U boats, sinking two of them at the expense of six convoy ships. That battle also took three of the German Navy's best submarine aces out of the war entirely. Three other U boats went down in March for a total of five, and another two in April. And although just one U-boat, U-110, was sunk in May, it was infiltrated prior to sinking by an Allied boarding party. They recovered a priceless treasure from that submarine, a German Enigma machine, the key to Germany's most elusive intelligence information. Moreover, one of its codes in particular, the Atlantic Naval Code, known as Hydra, would prove to be the eventual antidote to Britain's troubles at sea. It was around this time that Winston Churchill also issued his Battle of the Atlantic Directive, in which he called for merchant ships to be fitted out with anti-aircraft weapons, as well as some designated ships receiving more substantial armaments, while port security, dockyard congestion, and radar availability shortages would all be rapidly dealt with. So-called catapult-armed merchantmen, merchant ships with a catapult system to launch small numbers of fighter aircraft, took to the seas as well, and although those aircraft were more useful in shooting down the Luftwaffe bombers overhead, they were a precursor to the merchantman aircraft carriers that would fundamentally change the Battle of the Atlantic in just a few years. The battles between German submarines and Allied surface vessels became more and more closely contested as 1941 wore on. In June, four U-boats were sunk, including two that had been part of ten submarines swarming convoy HX-133. Despite their strength, this submarine swarm had been overcome by 13 escort vessels and only five of the convoy's ships were lost. Broken Enigma codes helped the Allies hunt down the resupply vessels that were supposed to be keeping the U-boat fleet active, and in July, Iceland was taken by the Allies, giving a secure waypoint where convoys could be protected during their journey. By now, both sides were aware that Britain's soft underbelly was in the Mid-Atlantic Gap, an 800-mile-wide stretch of sea too far into the ocean for either coast to support and too far south for assets in Greenland and Iceland to reach. But Britain adapted to this far better than the Germans did. Their codebreakers allowed convoys to evade U-boats and deploy aircraft in the right places, and better technology, more escorts, and the fact that Germany now had to fight on a separate front against the Soviets all turned out to be a huge help. In the second half of 1941, Britain lost a third of the tonnage that it had been losing in the first half of the year. From August to December, 15 new boats were sunk in exchange for less merchant ships and lives than had been lost before. The United States and Britain signed the Atlantic Charter, and it wasn't long before Americans too were incensed at the loss of one of their own naval corvettes. By and large, the Allies were getting their together. So much so that the Mid-Atlantic Gap shrunk significantly in size. Germany was getting stretched thin, and by all accounts, it appeared that the Battle of the Atlantic might soon become just a bunch of scattered skirmishes. But on December the 7th, 1941, America was brought into World War II in a very different way, on the scattering of islands in a very different ocean. And within just a few days, Hitler and Mussolini were at war with the United States as well. 
The period of the Battle of the Atlantic that took place immediately after the American entrance to the war goes by a few names. Historians call it the Second Happy Time. German strategists refer to it as Operation Drumbeat. German submarine crews called it the Golden Time. But it's what the submarine commanders called it that probably describes these months best. American shooting season. Taking advantage of America's state of disorganization and disorientation, German submarines were able to get up close and personal with the US Navy, whose destroyers and frigates were not ready for the demands of anti-submarine warfare. In the eastern waters, where U-boats were happiest to raid from Maine to North Carolina, the Navy had very close to nothing to work with. Although Germany could only get five large advanced U-boats to the American coast due to supply chain restrictions, those five submarines were more than enough to sink dozens of ships. 27 naval vessels went down in the first 10 days of Operation Drumbeat, and when German submarine commanders returned to France to resupply, they reported to Admiral Donitz that there were simply too many easy targets, too many sitting ducks unprotected by warships, and they were all too happy to keep their lights on at night. When two more waves of submarines arrived, one in North American coastal waters and one in the Caribbean, they found an American Navy that was still badly unprepared and didn't even start their inefficient slow convoy systems until three months after the attacks began. In February, Germany inflicted 430,000 tons of losses in the Atlantic at a cost of two U-boats. In March and April combined, they took almost a million tons and lost just seven U-boats and a destroyer for their trouble. In May and June, that number wasn't just almost a million, it was closer to 1.3 million tons at a cost of three U-boats and another destroyer. All in all, American shooting season had led to the loss of over three million tons of Allied ships and supply, over two-thirds of which were directly attributable to the U-boats. While 13 U-boats were destroyed in all, over a hundred more entered the fight. To say that these losses were devastating would badly undersell it. To say they were catastrophic would also badly undersell it. Because the losses in the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico, between the losses of goods, ships, and Allied lives, well, the German campaign in 1942 was crippling to the Allies. It was a blow that in many ways the United States Navy had to bear responsibility for in their slowness to upgrade or adapt their anti-submarine strategy based on hard lessons that Britain had already learned. Had the Americans taken a more proactive approach, many of those lives might not have been lost. Their reaction would eventually come in May, when the US was able to institute an organized convoy system running up and down the East Coast. Although the Americans and their Canadian and British support vessels didn't have the resources to guard the Caribbean and left gaps within the Gulf of Mexico, they did succeed in locking down ports from Halifax to Key West. The deterrent effect was immediate. Deprived of their formerly easy prey, the German U-boats largely returned to the Mid-Atlantic, where that undefended gap we mentioned earlier was once again the most appealing target. Admiral Donitz and his fleet adapted quickly, going back to a Wolfpack approach, but now with U-boats operating in 10s and 15s instead of 5s and 6s. But now, the addition of American convoys to that relatively small patch of ocean meant that escort ships were a lot easier to come by, and with American escort ships learning quickly, the Allies had far better luck fighting back. Allied losses continued to be severe. Over half a million tons went down every month from August to November. But in just August and September of 1942, 60 U-boats were sunk, far more than Germany had ever had to withstand before. In November, the Allies began to organize so-called support groups, flexible squads of combat vessels that could move quickly to support convoys that came under attack. These vessels gave the Allies a chance to finally go on the offensive, hunting down U-boats and, at times, patrolling directly over them until they were forced to come up for air. And new advances in weaponry, anti-sub weapons that could be launched or thrown ahead of where a submarine would be going, were a huge improvement on mines and depth charges, which were reactive at best and completely static at worst. Massive, targeted searchlights known as lay lights also help too, picking up U-boats at night and giving them just seconds to avoid being hit with depth charges. Lee lights all but nullified the U-boat's advantage in night attacks, and in the months after the Lee lights introduction, Allied shipping losses dropped by a full two-thirds. The Germans changed their ciphers. The British broke the ciphers again. Germany still had the upper hands, but the Allies were catching up. By March of 1943, the situation in Britain was dire. Supplies had dwindled dangerously low, particularly fuel stores, and if the situation continued on the course it had established during that time, the UK might finally have to sue for peace with Hitler. But within two months, the entire Battle of the Atlantic would be functionally over, and it would not be in Hitler's favor. By May the 24th, 1943, Admiral Donitz would order his submarine fleet out of the North Atlantic almost entirely. 
As for how those fortunes changed and why they changed so quickly, the answer comes via technology. For the first time, American long-range bombers were able to cross the Mid-Atlantic Gap, and they were specifically used in search-and-destroy missions against German bombers, not convoy escorts. Merchant aircraft carriers arrived around the same time with a full complement of new Grumman-made fighter aircraft, and as America put more ships on the water and North Africa became less of a naval conflict, more and more escort ships were able to join the Battle of the Atlantic. Some joined up with the convoys, others helped out the bombers by making hunter-killer groups of their own. By April, the Germans were sinking a fraction of the ships they once had—39 U-boat kills compared to a full 15 U-boats sunk in just one month. May was far, far worse. At one battle, centered around the convoy ONS-5, a pack of 30 U-boats set upon a merchant fleet escorted with just 16 warships of their own. Despite the U-boats' numerical and firepower advantage, six were lost for just 13 merchant ships. And across the Atlantic, 34 U-boats were destroyed in the Atlantic, nearly a quarter of the entire U-boat fleet. In exchange, the Allies lost 34 ships of their own. This represented the true tipping point in the Battle of the Atlantic, the moment where a U-boat strategy became untenable. Loss ratios of one to one were unthinkable for the U-boat fleet, which had always relied on evasion and surprise to compensate for lower numbers. And if they couldn't do that anymore, then all was lost. Admiral Donitz had wanted to sink more Allied ships than the Allies could produce. Now, more U-boats were being sunk than Germany could produce. Although the Allies didn't realize it for months, Donitz ended the Battle of the Atlantic rather than lose any more ships in an unwinnable war of attrition. In the rest of the war, German submarines were mostly constrained to operating in the South Atlantic, where they had more than their fair share of trouble contending with highly aggressive Brazilian mine layers and patrol boats. 32 Brazilian merchant vessels were attacked during battles in the South Atlantic. For that price, 10 U-boats were sunk. Although Germany made a few more attempts to restart hostilities using the element of surprise, the North Atlantic was functionally walled off to them. Aircraft had become too much, and after the Allies took back France following D-Day, Germany couldn't hope to sustain a fleet in open waters. Hitler's new generation Electra Boot submarines came too late too, and in few numbers to make any difference. German pattern running and homing torpedoes were a surprise, but they fell victim to Allied adaptability. Now unopposed, massive amounts of resources flowed to Britain and North Africa, and hundreds of U-boats had to be scuttled in ports as the Allies advanced. A last-ditch attempt to get some bases in Norway resulted in 23 of the U-boats sunk. When World War II ended, 174 U-boats surrendered with Germany, only a small fraction of those that had been built over the course of the war. The Allies had won the Battle of the Atlantic with authority. They had transformed the German submariners' happy times into a catastrophic total collapse. But despite the battle having concluded in one clear direction, that simple fact belies just how devastating the Battle of the Atlantic was. Over the course of the war, the Allies lost over 72,000 sailors and merchant seamen, 3,500 merchant ships, and nearly 200 warships. In exchange, the Germans lost 30,000 sailors, 50-odd warships, and 783 U-boats. In lives, the Allies paid twice the price the Germans did, and Germany claimed nearly five merchant vessels for every U-boat that sunk. According to one British official, 27% of all British merchant seamen were killed during the war, the highest casualty rate of all military branches during the war. In the Battle of the Atlantic's aftermath, the entire war in Europe was decided. As for how close Germany really came to starving out, the British experts still disagree to this day, but their failure meant the failure of the German war effort. The inability to stop the flow of Allied resources became the inability to stop the flow of Allied troops across the English Channel, then across Western Europe, then across Germany, and finally to Berlin. In many ways, the collapse of the U-boat campaign was the collapse of Nazi Germany. Sometimes, the dominoes just take a moment to fall.